Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Thursday, April the 1st. Honored to be here on the territories of the Musqueam, of the Squamish, of the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Honored to be here on their lands today. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, Good Friday, uh, there won't be any briefing or update. We will be updating uh, by written brief on Saturday. Updates on case counts and hospitalizations and other relevant information about COVID-19 in British Columbia on Saturday, April the 3rd. And then we'll be providing a in-person briefing next Tuesday uh, after that. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you, and thank you uh, very much, and good afternoon. Um, as I did last week, uh, today we'll be taking a slightly different approach to our usual briefing format and addressing some of the questions that I've received over the past uh, few weeks. We'll just uh, start with a high level uh, daily case information and then uh, go through some of these questions. So uh, in the last 24 hours, we've had 832 new cases diagnosed of COVID-19 here in British Columbia. And uh, again, yesterday we um, went over that <laughs> precipice of uh, 100,000 cases and we now have 100,880 people in British Columbia who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, today, 310 were in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 388 people were in the Fraser Health Region, 53 people were in Vancouver Island Health, 42 people in Interior Health and 39 in the Northern Health Region. Uh, we currently have 296 people in hospital with COVID-19, 79 of whom are in critical care or ICU. We've had an additional five deaths to report today, bringing the total number of people who've died from COVID-19 to 1,463 here in British Columbia. And our condolences go to the families and care providers and the communities who've lost their members. To date, we've had over 787,649 doses of all three COVID-19 vaccines that we've had available administered in BC and 87,394 second doses. More of the details on things like variants of concern and uh, the outbreak status will be in the statement when it's uh, later this afternoon. I know many people continue to have lots of questions about COVID-19, about our pandemic and about the vaccine. And I am always appreciative for the questions that people send in. I'm going to start today with talking a little bit about some of the vaccine questions. We now have three safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines here in BC and four that have been approved for use in Canada so far. And many people have asked me about the differences between these vaccines and about other vaccines that we have. So as many people know, um, are, are the first vaccines that were approved were produced by Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna. And they are the, the main ones, the most that we've had here in British Columbia. And they form, form the basis of our age-based risk program here in BC. And these are called messenger RNA vaccines. Since we, these have been approved, the latest two vaccines to be approved are what we call viral vector vaccines. They're the AstraZeneca um, Oxford or, or Serum Institute of India, same vaccine manufactured in two different places, the Covishield vaccine. And the other one is the Janssen, which is uh, the pharmaceutical arm of the Johnson & Johnson company. Both of these are similar vaccines. The Janssen one, however, is a single dose vaccine. So all four, all three of the others are two doses, which means you get one dose to prime your immune system and then a booster dose at some time later to increase and lengthen the time that your immune system responds to the virus. One of the things that we are learning is in the clinical trials that were designed was a, a, a wonderful collaboration around the world to try and get these vaccines. And it is amazing that we have a, four effective and safe vaccines um, that were uh, developed within a year of this virus even being identified. What we do know is that the clinical trials were done with as short a period of time in between doses as possible so that we could get as much information and get the vaccines out there as quickly as possible. So the first dose 
primes your immune system, the second dose leads to longer lasting protection. What we have learned since uh, from the clinical trials is that all of these vaccines are very effective with the second dose and the first dose, upwards of 76 to 79 percent and over 80 percent for the messenger RNA vaccines. In the real world, however, we are also finding out that these are very effective vaccines at preventing people from having serious illness, from hospitalization, from death, and we're finding more and more information that they do prevent even milder um, symptoms in people as well. And importantly for us, we've learned from the real world experience in the UK, in uh, Ireland, in places like uh, uh, Israel, and here in Canada, in both in Quebec and BC, where we have strong uh, programs, research to follow this, that after a single dose, you have very good protection, upwards of 80%, and that that lasts for many months. So these are important things that we, uh, we have learned. I've been asked a lot about how the body mounts its protection against the virus um, and if I'm vaccinated, why do I still have to wear a mask? It takes time for our body's immune system to respond to the vaccines, no matter which vaccine it is. And it develops two types of immunity. The first is one that we can measure in the blood, and this is called our antibodies. And we've seen a lot about antibodies recently because they're one of the markers that helps us understand if, we're, if we have those protective mechanisms against the virus. These antibodies bind to the, to the spike protein on the outside of the virus. And all of the vaccines that we have so far are designed to develop, you know, for your body's immune system to develop antibodies to this spike protein. What we don't know is what level of antibodies we need in our blood to protect us from infection or from a disease with this virus. That's what we call a correlate of protection. So if antibody levels don't get as high in some people, and we saw a study uh, including some from here in uh, BC, where antibodies in people who are older or people who have certain blood cancers or certain types of immune compromising conditions, those levels may not rise as high as they do in younger, healthier people. But what we don't know if, is, if that has any effect on how well the, the um, virus or the vaccine protects you from the virus in the first place. What we have seen from uh, the vaccine effectiveness studies that we have is that regardless of antibody levels, there's a very high protection in seniors in long-term care that lasts for many months, in healthcare workers, and we're continuing to monitor this on an ongoing basis. It could be because we have the other part of our immune system stimulated as well, and that's what we call the cell-mediated immunity. So triggering of the B cells and the memory cells in our body that activate if we're exposed to the virus. These take longer to develop, and they can't be as easily measured with a blood test. So the bottom line that we are learning and why we are, are continuing to focus our program the way we are is that the, the protection is very good, not perfect, but very good after a single dose. But it takes time for our body's response. So that protection isn't high enough in everybody uh, for about 21 days after vaccination. And for some people, that protection may not get as high um, even after two doses. So people can still be infected with COVID, particularly in the first couple weeks. And that's why right now it is still incredibly important, even after you've been immunized, even if your community has been immunized, that you take the precautions that we all need to continue with, wearing masks, keeping our distance, not getting together in crowds. Because even though we are partially protected, it takes that period of time before we are all protected. And we, the, um, the good news is, though, even after that single dose, within that shorter period of time, as our body's developing the immune response, we tend to have less severe disease. And we've seen that even though people can get infected, they don't end up in hospital. And thankfully, we haven't had deaths. But these are the things that we need to pay attention to for the next few months as more and more people are immunized. 
I've often been asked if I've had a, I get many questions about if I've had a reaction to another vaccine, particularly the influenza vaccine, can I get a COVID vaccine? And the answer is yes. These are very different vaccines. They're ones that are new platforms. They're things that we've not used before. And they tend to have very few ingredients in them. What we do know is that the messenger RNA vaccines do stimulate your body's immune response and can stimulate allergic reactions. And the, the product or the, the compound that stimulates the allergic reactions more frequently is called uh, polyethylene glycol or PEG. So if you know you have an allergy to PEG, and some people do, then you should be looking for the AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Otherwise, um, most people can take, don't have any reaction to the, um, don't have allergic reactions to the messenger RNA vaccines, and we know that the safety profile is really good. I've also been asked if I've had uh, Guillain-Barre, which is uh, sometimes comes after, uh, has been associated with some other, both viral infections, but also uh, some um, immunizations. Can you have a COVID vaccine? And so the answer again is yes. The uh, Guillain-Barre is a type of, of immune response, autoimmune response to your nervous system that can, is most often triggered by the infection itself and could be triggered by COVID as well. And it's very less likely, much, much less likely to have anything to do with the vaccine. Along with the vaccine programs, I get asked a lot, and I know there's been a lot of questions out there about the interval between our first and second doses for the three vaccines that we have right now. And as you know, in BC and in Canada, our strategy is to vaccinate as many people as possible as quickly as possible for the greater benefit of everyone. And no more important is that than now when we have started to see our cases take off again and we know the effects that they can have even if people don't end up in hospital we know that there's long-term effects that many people are experiencing from infection with COVID-19. So the strategy that we have taken protects us both as individuals and as a community and this is achieved by offering the first dose of vaccine to more people beginning with those at higher risk of having more severe illness. And we know that the single most important risk factor is age. And then we'll go back and provide a second dose. And we know the Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, has looked very carefully at this evidence, as have we here in British Columbia, and advised that the time between the first and second doses of the COVID vaccines, all three of them that we have in Canada right now and in BC, can be extended up to four months. And this allows as many people as possible to get that excellent protection of 80% or more from as quickly as possible. The second dose will be offered as soon as all eligible people in British Columbia have received their first dose or at least been offered their first dose. And in most cases, that will mean less than four months. We are on track, if the, if the vi vaccines continue to come, we're on track to get everybody um, offered a vaccine by um, early July, by the end of June. The other thing though that we will continue to follow is whether uh, extending that interval actually has some benefits to people and we've seen that with other vaccines that the longer the interval you have the more time your body's immune system has to develop that cell mediated immunity and that may give us better and longer lasting protection and that may help us get through the next respiratory season even though COVID is likely to be with us for some time so those are things we don't yet know and we will be learning as we learn more about um, how the vaccines are working in people around the world. We also don't know how well these vaccines will continue to work as we see more variants of concern that are um, circulating in our province and around the world. This approach also allows people to benefit from their own protection as well as the protection that arises because others will be vaccinated and that reduces the chance that any of us will spread the virus. And for some people, 
they don't develop as much antibody as we've heard about. Sometimes people with blood cancers, um, people uh, who are older may not have as good protection even after two doses. So it is that much more important that the most of us in the community are immunized and protected and that reduces all of our chances of being exposed to the virus in the first place. And that is something that we are seeing now with the dramatic decrease that we've seen in the UK, for example, um, when they've had a, reached a tipping point in the population. One of the other questions I receive a lot is about how come we're immunizing healthcare workers and we're immunizing people who are extremely vulnerable, clinically vulnerable, we're immunizing elderly people um, because we know that they are at risk, and how come we're not immunizing the, the family caregivers as well, whether that's uh, somebody who's caring for a, a child who, has, who can't be immunized or somebody who's caring for elderly parents. What we've learned is that these vaccines are very effective in, in protecting people directly, unlike many other vaccines. So we know it works well in elderly people, for example. So our priority is to get vaccine as it arrives into those people who are most at risk first to protect you directly and then to protect all of us. We have immunized home care health workers, health care workers in, in long-term care and hospitals, etc., because they provide care to many vulnerable people. But when you're visiting an individual, your loved one or friend in a long-term care home, or providing care to one person in your home, um, you are only exposed to them. And that's why it's so important that we continue to protect ourselves directly by using the, uh, the measures that we have in our community and to take precautions until our age group comes up. It would not be possible to immunize every family member or parent of every vulnerable person with the vaccines that we have available right now. So we need to do this on a risk-based process and we know that the most important risk right now is age. The good news is that we will have more vaccines arriving, especially in the next few weeks, and we will all be able to receive our important first dose by June. Many people also wonder uh, this week especially about the pause that we've had in the, uh, the COVID shield, which is the Serum Institute of India, the AstraZeneca vaccines uh, for those under the age of 55 and how that may impact the immunization of, our, in, of workers in our worker program. So as we reported earlier this week, there has been a series of rare but very serious blood clots, sometimes in the brain, associated with low platelets that uh, has been seen in a small number of younger people in Europe. Initially, the reports that we saw were about a risk of one in a million, but uh, a study from Germany showed that there was about 29 cases in about three million doses. So that means the, it could be as high as one in a hundred thousand. And really, it was the uncertainty. Health Canada, NACI, the uh, Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health, which I per participate in, looked at this issue in detail and decided we needed to have more information to determine what the risks and benefits were of this vaccine here in Canada. Very importantly, we have not seen any evidence of this here in Canada. There's been very low numbers around the world, several dozen only. But because it is the risk of a severe illness and death being tied to age, as we've talked about, Anyone over 55 especially, with the rates of transmission that we're seeing here in BC, the AstraZeneca COVID Shield vaccine clearly has benefits to you as an individual and to our community to make sure that we can get as many people immunized as quickly as possible. And these benefits far outweigh any risk of these very rare blood events. For younger people, we know they don't usually get as ill. So we want to make sure that these clots, because they can be severe or even fatal, we want to make sure that we know what the risk benefit is for younger people. And we're able to do that in BC and in Canada because we have alternative vaccines. But let me be very clear, we do not expect to see any of these cases in Canada. There are still uh, scientists in Europe, in the UK, who are looking at this in detail and trying to understand what it is. This is a safety signal 
that we picked up because we are looking very carefully. When you immunize millions of people with new vaccines, this is something we watch for, and it's important that we're able to take action when we see something to get more information before we proceed. So if you have received this vaccine, be reassured that it works very well. It's an effective vaccine, and we know it's safe. And if it's beyond 20 days, then you're beyond the risk factor uh, period for these very rare events anyway. But there is a test and there is treatment. So if you have any concerns, there's much more information on the BC CDC website about what exactly we're talking about, what are the signs to look for, and what the concerns would be. But I'm very confident that we will get to the bottom of this, and this is still an important vaccine for our programs here in Canada and around the world. The other questions that I get about these vaccines, we uh, know that these vaccines, this uh, AstraZeneca, work best when the second dose is at three to four months. And so people ask if I've received it already, when am I going to get my second dose and will it be with the AstraZeneca vaccine? And the, the, question, the answer is um, we're still um, working on that and we have some time to figure that out to make the best decision about dose two. And this is something as well that we're uh, uh, collaborating around the world to best understand. The other thing that is happening right now in the UK, where this vaccine has been used in millions, tens of millions of people, is they are doing what we're calling a mix and match study. So they have Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine that has been used widely across the UK and Scotland and other areas. And what they are doing is a study looking at taking the AstraZeneca first and then the, the Pfizer, the Pfizer first and then the AZ, um, and what is the best dose interval. And we're going to have have a lot more information about that and that study in the next couple of weeks and that will help us um, give the best advice about what, a, what vaccine people should receive second and it might be a messenger RNA vaccine, a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine and when is the best interval for that. So we are responding as I said to a safety signal and when we get more information we will update our guidance. In the meantime the vaccine is very effective and far, far better than getting sick with COVID-19. What this has meant, however, is that our worker program that was to start next week as we received more of the, the AstraZeneca vaccine will be um, put on pause for now. So the many uh, workers and first responders who were, uh, we were starting to get into that program were going to need to regroup and we will come back early next week or as soon as we have more information to determine how we're going to move forward with that program. One of the other questions that, I often, uh, that I've been getting a lot of in the last week is how do we determine who is clinically extremely vulnerable? And I understand there's a wide range of serious illnesses and some people are wondering how that was determined. Well, I can tell you the list and the, the actual clinical conditions that people received letters, and I know many of you are receiving them now, was based on data from around the world and reviewed by a panel of experts led by uh, physicians at the, public, uh, the Provincial Health Services Authority. So that includes cancer specialists, kidney specialists, infectious disease doctors, pediatrics, developmental pediatrics, and important groups uh, like uh, Community Living BC, where we know many people receive services. So those groups are um, based on data and evidence and science. And we ask people, please, um, be patient. You should receive a letter by the 15th, and you will be able to um, book in after that for your vaccine. And I know many people have already. But we need physicians and uh, people who are concerned that they're not on this list. We need your support to stick with these categories as they have been developed. Everyone will get vaccines in the next few months, and each group is protected as all of us are vaccinated. 
Um, I've asked, uh, had many questions about the status of the the J and J, the Janssen vaccine, and when we might be available. And the answer, unfortunately, is we don't yet know. Uh, we are hearing that there will be a shipment that we are may receive by the end of April, but we have no timeline yet confirmed. So that's good news, and we will stay tuned and let people know. And the advantage of the the Johnson Janssen vaccine is that it is a single dose vaccine. So there's a lot of flexibility that can come with that vaccine. The other one that we know is on the horizon that uh, may get approval in the next few weeks um, is the Novavax vaccine, also a very effective vaccine that we've not yet had here in, in Canada. And these will be very helpful And what we are planning to do, again, because all three of these, the AstraZeneca, the Johnson Johnson, the Novavax, are fridge-stable vaccines, being able to kickstart our front re first responder and worker program as soon as they become available. So if you have any other questions about our vaccine program, there are, I encourage everybody to go to the BC CDC and Immunize BC website. There's much detailed information there for everybody about these vaccines, about who they work in, about the ingredients in the vaccines, and the things that you can expect. And the information there will be updated regularly. So as we come into this long weekend, all of us recognize our need to connect. And it has been a long, long year for many. But we need to ensure more than ever that we are socializing safely because we do have an end in sight. All of this talk about vaccines and about how well they are going to work to protect us in our communities is, is in sight, but it's not here yet. If you do choose to spend time with anyone other than your immediate household in this weekend, it must be outdoors. And all of the COVID-19 safety plans and precautions need to continue to be followed as more and more of our seniors and elders in particular are protected. We need to give that time for that best protection to take hold. That means ensuring you're giving enough space to others, staying away if you're feeling at all unwell and staying with that same group, small group of people. I'd also like to speak to a little bit about expectations for travel. I know this is a time when people think about that. This is not the time for any of us to be traveling for leisure or vacation or getaways outside of our community. Travel is still very high risk for all of us. We see that, we see that it ta we take the risk from where we are coming and we take it um, home from where we have been. So if you are in doubt at all this weekend, just don't go. A good line, guideline is to think about staying within the area where you would go for a day trip. If it requires an overnight stay, a vacation rental, then it is not a good idea right now. If you need a break, go to a local campground, stay in a local hotel. Staying local will support our local businesses. And we all know how important that is right now with the restrictions that we've had to put in place this week to try and get our numbers down. Get takeaway from your local restaurant. Support your local community. Today as well, our seniors and elders in care are safely able to be visited over the next few weeks. We know that families have been waiting for this for a long time, and it's going to be an emotional and a welcome homecoming. But we need to be cautious and be careful. We know that the, the immunization in our long-term care homes across the province has been very high, but we can still get virus introduced into homes, and we don't want that now. We know that everybody who's been isolated from friends and family for these many, many months need to have that connection and we need to do it safely. So that means wearing masks, that means going by yourself, having your visit with your loved one only and making sure that if you are feeling unwell at all, that you wait for another time. As we look to our long weekend, we need to make this a safe long weekend so that we can get through this phase of our pandemic as more and more vaccine is available in the weeks to come. We all have the same ability 
to spread COVID-19, and we all have the same ability to stop the spread, and we know what to do. Staying small, staying outside, staying local will help us bend our curve again as our immunization program moves up. I hope you all have a safe and enjoyable weekend, and please remember to be kind to each other, to be calm, and to stay safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. I wanted to start by um, extending my condolences. Those are the premiers, those are the governments, those are the people in BC, to the uh, family, the friends, the caregivers of the five people who passed away uh, from COVID-19 or related to COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, one in the Fraser Health Authority, three in the Northern Health Authority, and one lived in Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, it's a difficult time for loss. We know this. We know there have been and continue to be restrictions in the ways that we can grieve and come together. So that means we have to, in these times, I think, show more connection, more support for one another, more solidarity with one another. And I'm thinking of all of those families and all of the families who have lost loved one in this pandemic and in the other public health emergency, the overdose um, uh, public health emergency. Um, Dr. Henry has noted 296 people in hospital uh, from COVID-1979 in critical care uh, today. We continue, uh, our health care workers throughout the health hospital system continue to do extraordinary work under these circumstances. We continue to have lower capacity than we typically expect as we have made significant adjustments in our, our hospital system, but nonetheless in areas of high uh, COVID-19 transmission areas such as Fraser Health, but also in Northern Health, we see real pressures in our hospital, and we want to—I think all of us want to support our healthcare workers in the acute in acute care as they work through uh, all of the challenges that they're facing. I want to, like Dr. Henry, talk about a few issues that I get asked about, and the first I think is vaccine and immunization and supply. I just want to note that the fundamental issue, the real question, the real challenge that we all face is the amount of vaccine. Uh, today, um, happy to announce that 787,549 vaccinations have been taken place in BC. That 700,155 of those are first doses. That's 16.28 percent, or almost one in six of the population, and 87,394 are second doses. We announced at noon that those. Um, uh, who are 72 and older, so a new age cohort, those born in 1949 or before, are now able to call in and book appointments. I note that that hasn't moved as quickly this week because we also added this week 150,000 people or in the broader cohort who will, who will have received letters or will eventually receive letters who are clinically extremely vulnerable. Dr. Henry has talked about how that list was developed, but that obviously is a significant uh, addition to the list who are in our main uh, COVID-19 program that, it, that is using Pfizer and Moderna. I want to say that it's, it's supply, though. It's one in six. And what ha has been exceptional in our immunization program led by Dr. Penny Vallon has been exceptional at delivering vaccine as it, as it arrives in BC. And in fact, that is what has been happening consistently. And you can see that with the more than 90 percent of residents, more than 90 percent of staff in long-term care in assisted living. Uh, both residents and staff and health care workers. The fact is that First Nations Health Authority announced this week that every uh, First Nations community around BC has now uh, had their immunization clinic against COVID-19. These are extraordinary achievements to take that much vaccine under that much scrutiny and that have the highest vulnerability is exceptional. In the 90, 90 and above category, 44,913 people have been immunized, out of approximately 50,000 people over 90 in BC. In the 85 to 89 category, it's 62,430 have been immunized, out of approximately 72,000. In the 80 to 84 category, that's 88,555 people, and we're making progress every day on that. In the 75 to 79 category, it's 79,808. In short, uh, all of the priorities that were laid out in detail in January have been uh, ha for priority 
for vulnerability, for saving lives with vaccine in BC have been the priorities. And we are, in fact, ahead of schedule. I told you from this podium that we expected approximately 10 percent of people to be immunized by March 31st. That number, because of the decisions that have been taken by Dr. Henry and others with respect to dosage, is 16.28 percent, which is better than 10 percent, but still, again, limited by the supply of vaccine. I want people to also understand that uh, there has been and there is some inconsistency in when we get vaccines. So um, uh, this, um, uh, the week of March 22nd to 27th, for example, we expected, uh, we're told that we'd receive 161,460 doses of Pfizer, and we received 161,460 doses of Pfizer. We were expecting 112,400 doses of Moderna that week. We received 34,000 doses of Moderna. We were expecting this to receive the remaining 78,400 doses of Moderna from that shipment this week. And while we still expect it, and we expect all of that vaccine to arrive, uh, that vaccine, 72,000 of it, is expected to arrive Saturday. Um, if you look at uh, next week, April 4th to 10th, we were expecting 138,060 doses of Pfizer and a further 111,900 doses of Moderna. But when that changes or when delivery is delayed is an extraordinary challenge. I think it's a real tribute to our teams that those changes have been dealt with uh, seamlessly in a way that, that uh, is obviously very challenging to deal with, but the, that I think our teams have done a very good job in doing. With respect to AstraZeneca, the changes as described by Dr. Henry in, uh, and the safety signals changed our AstraZeneca campaign this week, as everybody knows. And so on Monday, uh, those, uh, that change and that uh, with respect to people under 55 was announced. By Tuesday, we'd organized, working with the BC Pharmacy Association, work that had been ongoing on all these issues for some time, changed and, ha and put forward a strategy to ensure that the AstraZeneca that we had was used in full, and every dose will be used in full. And that meant that 18,000 doses have been distributed now to pharmacies across uh, Metro Vancouver, and that is happening now. So that is good news. Learned on Monday, changed on Tuesday, people were immunized yesterday, which is impressive and a real tribute to the BC Pharmacy Association, our partners in this. We know that there are many more than 18,000 people involved in these categories. For example, just in Metro Vancouver alone, 198,561 people between the ages of 55 and 59, and 184,371 people between the ages of 60 and 64 just there, and many more, of course, around the problems. But we wanted to make sure that all of our doses went out, and they have. The good news is, that a further supply of AstraZeneca has virtually just arrived in BC. That's a f further 188,800 doses, and more is expected next week. And uh, over the next few days, uh, Dr. Ballam and her team will be informing people of how that will be distributed. So, and we'll see a significant portion of that going in to our uh, effort with the BC Pharmacy Association. And I think all of that is good news. But that is the, the way I think our team has been working focusing on those who need the most protection first and delivering vaccine very soon after it arrives in BC. I think it's a real achievement. I think British Columbians can be proud. When I hear from people who've been vaccinated, who go to our clinics across the province, they tell me story after story about how well they were treated, how efficiently it was run, and that is a credit to our healthcare teams. I am so proud of them and so proud of everyone involved in organizing this and very proud of our partners in pharmacy as well. Uh, Dr. Henry talked briefly about long-term care. I'll be one of those people visiting a loved one in long-term care this weekend. But I want to say this. This is a time to be prudent and careful and generous. Our partners, whether they are in the, the publicly funded beds in a, a private care home or in a public care home, our partners and health care workers uh, need our support as well in making this work properly. We have to listen when we're advised about safety and follow safety guidelines. It is especially important now that we do so in every possible way. And so that means that if anyone is even thinking or close or feels they might be ill, not to visit a care home this weekend, even though it's been, I know, for many people, a year's wait. We have to be prudent and care about infection control right now. It is very important. 
that, that residents of long-term care get visits. It's also very important that all of us stay safe. I want to just note very briefly um, uh, today that, uh, that uh, health authorities um, uh, report that uh, in the week of March 15th to 21st, 6,894 surgeries were completed in British Columbia. Uh, and that is, of course, significantly more than last year. As you recall, last year at this time, uh, the uh, non-urgent uh, scheduled surgeries or elective surgeries were uh, postponed in British Columbia. So obviously that comparison doesn't work anymore. I just wanted to uh, uh, break that out by health authority. That's 1,993 in Fraser Health. 1,145 in Interior Health, 364 in Northern Health, 1,663 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 1,450 in Vancouver Island Health, and 279 in the Provincial Health Services Authority. I just want to say there is usually a somewhat of a slowdown, which was less this year than in most years around March break, but I want to thank all of our teams, people, uh, our anesthesiologists, our whole teams, uh, our surgeons, our surgical nurses, our healthcare workers, our health sciences professionals, everyone involved in, uh, in our surgery program, which continues to meet and exceed all expectations in this very, very difficult time to operate in BC. Um, finally, I just wanted to sit, note that our online platform for the booking of immunizations um, uh, will go live on April the 6th. I just want people to prepare for what the process will be. There will be significant information presented uh, publicly on all platforms on April 5th to let people know more about this. It's a process uh, that will continue to be a call center. So for people who cannot use or don't, uh, aren't able, don't like to use online platforms, there will also be a call center backing it up. But our online platform will be in place on that day. The idea of it is when it's close to the time for your age cohort to come forward to register, when it's time for your age cohort to book, you will be sent a text or informed, and then you book your appointment. So it's registered, invitation, book. That's rib, right? That's rib. Okay. That's, that's coming up April 6th, and uh, I think it also will be a legacy to the province in terms of how we, uh, how we can track immunizations from a public health perspective, but also how people can get access to the information about their own immunizations. So that is rolling out next week, and there'll be more information coming forward. Um, in closing, I want to say that, that today, this, it, we're going into the Easter weekend. It's uh, uh, typically, uh, although not as much the last two years, when my favorite holiday weekends of the year for all kinds of reasons, personal and, uh, and, and otherwise. But uh, this weekend, uh, you know, it's not about uh, the person we saw going the wrong way down an aisle at a grocery store. It's not about the group we saw in the park that looked larger than 10. It's not about the person who seemed closer to us than six feet or the person whose mask wasn't on right. It's not about the mistakes any of us has made. Today is not about what we didn't do, failed to do, or should have done. So today is, is, isn't about our ideas about who led the spread. Today is about how we unite in the fight to stop the spread. Today is about what we can do, what we must do, and what we will do to stop the spread. Today is about where we are, about who we are, and about where we need to be. Today, 16.3% of the 4.3 million eligible British Columbians have had their first dose of our available vaccine. That's encouraging but it's nowhere near enough. So today is the day in our hearts, our words and our actions, especially our actions, when we commit to the simple truth. It's us and the vaccines against COVID-19. Our focus right now must be tight on what we need to do today and tomorrow and right through this Easter weekend to stop the spread. Let's focus on the immediate work at hand and let's, let's keep moving forward together because we're all better when we're working together. We know how to dig in, we know how to dig deep, and we can get ourselves out of a tight COVID hold. So let's bend a new curve, not the old rules. It's us and the vaccines against COVID-19. Our aim is clear, our purpose is defined. Unite in the fight to stop the spread. Let's get on with that this weekend. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons 832 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positifs pour COVID-19 pour un total de 100,000 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer 5 nouveaux décès 
liés au Covid-19, pour un total de 1463 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches le proche pendant cette pandémie. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de Covid-19, 296 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 79 en soins intensifs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. As a reminder to reporters on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Please also remember to take your phone off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. Our first question today is from Justine Hunter at the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Thanks, and I almost hesitate to ask another question about vaccines, but the Pharmacy Association lobbied hard to get their members involved in this distribution, and I'm wondering, Mr. Dix, did the province negotiate any kind of commitment that they would not offer preferential treatment to their own customers for this very in-demand vaccine? So let me just start by saying um, they've been lobbying, yes, but we've also uh, had a very strong partnership with pharmacists since 2009 um, during the influenza pandemic in 2009 when pharmacists in, uh, in BC became uh, important partners in immunization. So this is in a negotiation of discussions that we've been having ongoing um, since we started uh, to have vaccines available. So they have always been part of our program. I don't think this is an issue of anybody lobbying. Uh, we, uh, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, more than 1.1 million doses of influenza vaccine were delivered by BC pharmacists in the context of a pandemic. It was an extraordinary success and roughly uh, 450,000 more, I believe, than had been done last year. So we're working pretty closely with uh, BC pharmacists. The Pharmacy Association has been partnered with us and working with us as we prepare for the many phases of this immunization campaign. I think I've said already, I think Dr. Henry said already, that especially for second doses, we see pharmacists playing an even more central role than they play now. And I think it's impressive that as we made changes, required by safety signals with the safety and health of people in our province. We made changes to our program this week. Pharmacists stepped up and the BC Pharmacy Association stepped up and did this work. And uh, what we have is a process of between 55 and 64 that people were able to book appointments. We know, uh, Justine, that there are hundreds of thousands of people in this category. And initially, we were distributing 18,000 doses of AstraZeneca. Why did we do that? Because we wanted to make sure that every drop of vaccine goes to people in BC before any expiry date. That's why we proceeded in the way we did. But that is the basis now as we expand out the number of pharmacies. And I think next week, the number of communities involved um, we are going to uh, be able to have more and more success at delivering that. It's not what was planned. As Dr. Henry has said, we've made some changes this week because circumstances changed, because what we could do changed. We adapted, and the BC Pharmacy Association and pharmacists were part of that, and I think it was, it's been very effective so far. So really, the idea is to deliver between people 55 and 64 as we continue to go down and down and down in ages in our main um, age-based campaign. And this will assist that and obviously assist the speed of that campaign when, when the age-based campaign meets that 55 to 64 cohort uh, in uh, not too long a while. So uh, pharmacists are doing a good job. They're delivering, uh, they're going to be delivering, I think, uh, uh, in the, these days uh, about 18,000 doses of AstraZeneca. And um, really, the, you qualify in that um, uh, in that vaccine pr program from being 55 to 64, and everyone who gets immunized will have to be in that age cohort. Justine, do you have a follow-up? I do. Uh, the question, though, is about the, an issue of preferential treatment. And we've spoken to two individuals who say they were denied a vaccine because they were not regular customers of the pharmacy they were trying to get the shot at. So my question is, is that acceptable or do you think that it needs to be explicit that pharmacies are not going to favor their own customers with this vaccine? As you talk to the pharmacies, the issue here is supply. The issue is that we have hundreds of thousands of people eligible in these categories. And right now we had 18,000. As I told you, we were about to receive a very significant, uh, we have received and will be distributing out 
over the coming uh, number of days, over the weekend. Uh, probably it will be starting next week. Uh, further 188,500 uh, doses, much of which will go into this program. So that's the issue. The issue is supply, as it always is. Uh, we would like to be immunizing way more people in BC, but we're immunizing to the supply that we have. And again, this isn't a criticism of the Government of Canada. We don't have domestic capacity. Really, the countries that are well ahead of us in the percentage of immunization have the domestic capacity to produce vaccine. We don't have that in BC. And so we are limited by supply. And so it's inevitable when you have this much demand for vaccine, more demand for vaccine in an age cohort than you have vaccine available. There are some people who are, aren't going to be on that. But we're clo working closely with the Pharmacy Association and with uh, pharmacists across BC. I think they're going to do a great job. I am so proud of the work pharmacists did in the influenza campaign. And the key point for everyone is, the key point for everyone, is everyone is going to get access to their first dose by the end of June. That's, that's what we are seeing now, given the supplies we expect to be coming. Everyone is. But whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, it's critical right now to follow public health rules. Let me give you one example as to why. In Prince Rupert, we've uh, immunized about 9,000, a little over 9,000, I think it's 9,008 people in the town of Prince Rupert in our campaign, in our effort there in the last week, our all of community effort in Prince Rupert. In the last number of days, uh, the last four days leading into today, I believe 67 people uh, tested positive for COVID-19, partly because they would have uh, had the transmission prior to their immunization, but also because, as Dr. Henry has explained now in some detail and did today, it takes some time for the vaccine to take full effect. So what that means is that everyone's going to get their chance before the end of June, and our determination, my direction, is to get vaccines into the hands of the most vulnerable first and to get it out as quickly as possible. And uh, that's what we've been doing in BC. We're only limited by the amount of vaccine we have, and we're delighted every time any vaccine arrives in BC, as it did today. Our next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Please go ahead. Dr. Henry, we haven't seen the variant numbers in a few days. I'm going to assume the variants continue to climb. Why are we not doing anything specifically to address variant spread? I'm sure you've heard from other experts who say that we should be adjusting parts of our plan to note variant spread. I'm just curious why we're not, and is there anything specifically that can be done around the Easter long weekend when people may be more likely to gather uh, indoors for a supper or for a holiday gathering? Uh, yeah, so we did uh, report on the variants and it'll be in our statement today. But I can tell you over the last two days, um, because uh, it's um, the whole genome sequencing is only run uh, periodically during the week, um, and it, they missed a day. So we had 90 new cases identified as variants in the last uh, two days. Um, the 80 of them were B117, one more of the uh, B1351, which is associated with South Africa, and nine more of the P1, which is uh, Brazil, which uh, we've been watching very closely. And most of the P1 is one of the ones we're most concerned about, um, has, is in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region. And we have, of course, adjusted our approach um, to ensure that we're doing surveillance. So now we have over 90% of all of our positive cases are screened for variants of concern, and there's a delay. It takes a day to do the screening test. We screen for a specific um, marker, and then we do the whole genome sequencing to see which specific variant it is. So what we know about these variants of concern, we've talked about, they. Uh, um, they spread more easily in most cases, and in some cases they lead to more severe illness. We're also concerned that some of them seem to have uh, a reduced response to some of the vaccines, although uh, the new data that's come out this week has shown that uh, particularly the B117, um, all of the vaccines that we have in, in Canada work well, and uh, same with um, 
the P1. It's the uh, uh, the B1351 uh, that is a little bit more concerning, but it still has good response. So what we, we also know is they may be more transmissible, but the very same things that we do to prevent the old viruses that we were seeing are the things that work for this as well. But what we know is that that, that margin of error is that much less that it can spread more easily. So we're seeing um, more contacts who, are, uh, who become positive as well with some of these variant cases. And yes, we're doing additional testing. You saw that in some of the exposure events we had in schools, particularly in Surrey, around the B117. And thankfully, what we found was that there was not transmission in the schools uh, for the most part. So that's good news. We are doing additional testing, but every single case in VC is followed up, whether it's a variant or not. And we often don't know um, until a couple of days later. So we are watching carefully around hospitalization rates and people who end up in ICU. I can tell you that uh, especially uh, we've been investigating, there was a cluster, a large cluster in uh, Vancouver Coastal um, that is now contained and there's been an increase in these P1 um, in Vancouver Coastal and Whistler and some of that has spread to other parts of the, of the province in very small numbers but we are watching very carefully and following up people very carefully. But there's no focal um, super spreading event that's related to these. What we're finding is there's small chains of transmission in multiple areas that aren't linked. So it is community spread and that's why it's so important that we take the actions that we did in and around Whistler um, to, to try and reduce those opportunities for spread and we are supporting people to self-isolate if they're in uh, group accommodations for example to isolate safely we have places uh, to support people to do that. So the, the same measures that we take um, that for um, COVID all along work for the variants, we just have to do them more carefully, and that's more important than ever this weekend. Maybe the active case numbers. Well. Oh, yeah, the active case numbers are actually down a little bit. This will all be in the statement, um, but they're down to 192, um, and we have uh, 35 people who are currently in hospital uh, with one of the variants. I've mentioned this before, but uh, we do follow uh, the demographics and uh, what we're seeing is it is mostly a younger age group uh, between 19 and, and 50 uh, f overall. Um, and for the, uh, the P1 that we're seeing, not surprisingly given where we're seeing it, uh, mostly 19 to 39 year age group. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, I, I've heard a lot from a group of people across the province from age 65 to 71 who quickly saw people slightly older for them get chances to reserve vaccinations. They have now seen some younger than them in Metro Vancouver not be able to receive AstraZeneca. There's a lot of frustration from this group that wants access to the vaccine. I know there was an update today for one of those years, but can you give these people some hope of when they will be able to register for their vaccine and explain to them why seemingly it is taking much longer to get to them as it was some ages around them. Yeah, you know, uh, and there's a couple of, there's two different things that are going on there. One, as we've moved down the age groups, um, it has been very closely tied to amount of vaccine that we've received. And uh, Minister Dix mentioned we were expecting a large shipment of Moderna last week, which was delayed, and still a large part of it hasn't arrived. And in addition, um, we have the clinically extremely vulnerable group that has now started to be in, and that's another 150,000 people. And as we move down every single year, the number of people or the cohort gets larger. So it was, um, and some of the health authorities, uh, particularly in the Lower Mainland, when they had vaccine last weekend, had gone down to uh, 73. But then as more vaccine didn't come in at exactly the right time, it was kind of stuck at, at that age for a couple of days. So it, we are titrating it to, to vaccine that we receive. And we've gone down today, we expect, um, in the next few days, as more vaccine comes in next week, assuming it all arrives when expected, that we'll be able to, uh, to continue to move down to the, um, hopefully very soon, to um, 70, 65 and up. 
So the, the, the rationale or why we, we had a small amount of the AstraZeneca, it was after we had seen the safety signal, we weren't sure um, how many people would be uh, receptive to receiving it. And I'm just very, very pleased that people have recognized um, the value of this vaccine. And uh, we had a small amount of it that was expiring tomorrow. Um, and we targeted it in the area where uh, we have the highest rates and we wanted to target the population that was not likely to be in the age group within the next few weeks. So that's uh, the rationale that I used, we used to make the decision about uh, where we put the 18,000 doses of the AstraZeneca. So it wasn't in any way um, to, to slight those in the uh, 65 to, to 72 age group. It was because we knew there was more vaccine coming into that um, core of our program that would be available within the coming days and weeks. So it's trying to find that balance of, of getting both at the same time as much as we could. And really what the challenge has been um, that, um, that I'm working on, that we're working on is uh, we were committed to using the, the more flexible fridge stable vaccines for our worker program and we'll need to recalibrate how we're going to do that. So I'm asking for patience from all of our first responders and the other uh, worker groups that we had identified. We have been using vaccine, as you know, um, to try and address um, workplace outbreaks and we don't have that supply right now because of the uh, um, the, the, the stop on using of, of AstraZeneca with the younger age group for now. So we are hopeful and we'll be following, I know much of my weekend, we'll be looking at uh, the data that's coming out of Europe and uh, following up with our colleagues in Health Canada and, uh, and hopefully we can get that back on track as soon as possible. Our next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Marcella, please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. I hope to ask you more about the situation involving Alberta now looking at making people who tested positive for variants of concern quarantine, quarantine for up to 24 days. What efforts are being made here in BC to ensure those who are supposed to be quarantining for at least 14 days are actually isolating themselves and others in their homes? So um, uh, that is, um, it's a, there's a bit of a nuance to that, Martella. <laughs> so it is if you are in a, a close contact with somebody um, who is uh, positive with one of the variants because it's more transmissible and we're seeing transmission, transmission in households. So if you are still in that household and people can't effectively isolate within that household, then uh, you are no longer infectious after 10 days and the quarantine period for your close contacts starts after that infectious period. So that's where you get the 24 days. So they are supporting some people um, to leave their household for the 10 days of their infectious period and um, it be in hotels or other places. And we have done that in some places as well. Um, Whistler's a classic example where we had a lot of transmission in, in accommodation, in group accommodations that were related to workplaces. We were able to go in and do some immunization there as well, but it's very challenging to find places for people to safely uh, isolate. And for some families, um, that's not acceptable to them. So they would prefer to be together at home um, for that whole period of time. So it's a combination. We've been doing that in many areas of the province. Um, uh, the clusters in the community in Big White and some parts of uh, the downtown east side where we're able to uh, effectively separate people. Uh, right now we do uh, case management and contact tracing and do work with families and have uh, uh, also do t uh, asymptomatic testing of people, um, particularly focused on people with these more transmissible variants. So it is a, a strategy that is um, it's, it's more of a, a, a localized decision with the local uh, contact tracing team on an individual basis. Marcella, do you have a follow-up? I do. I forgot to ask you how many people are isolating now, but if you could add that in. And the other question I have was that you mentioned during your earlier comments about um, people now having to wait. Could you specify is that first responders, teachers, like are the essential service workers that may now have to wait a little bit longer to get a specific clinic done for them. Yeah, so all of the, de I didn't go through all the details today. I'm trying to, you know, do these questions things on Thursdays so that we have a little bit more time to 
get into some depth, but we uh, it will be in the uh, in the statement. Uh, we have about uh, currently active. <laughs> there's a there's a comma in the wrong spot. I almost had a fit here. It said seventy five thousand. I, I think it's seven thousand five hundred and seventy one. So that is up um, considerably right now. Um, but in terms of the active cases that are variants, it's down to one hundred and ninety two. Um, and there's now about uh, eleven thousand six hundred people who are um, self isolating right now. And, and yes, the, the, uh, you know, our intent was always the main part of our program was the age-based program with Pfizer and Moderna. And we have this parallel stream that we started with first responders, with uh, workplaces, um, that was dependent on our fridge-stable vaccine that we were doing in communities with, uh, with pharmacies and pharmacists um, assisting at workplaces and work sites. So that, um, that is on pause now because most of the workers are uh, younger than 55. So we are recalibrating. We're going to be following, as I mentioned, uh, what's happening uh, with, uh, around the world with uh, the data around this uh, vaccine. And I am confident that we will be able to get back to that program soon. Um, but we need to make sure that uh, we are all comfortable with the safety and uh, with who um, the best population to use it. So that's why it's so important that it uh, looks like we might be getting some Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, that will allow us to, to take that program going again uh, or uh, Novavax if it comes in the next few weeks as well. So it, it is a, a pause on that program for now um, until we get more information about how we can best do that and move it forward again. Our next question is from Binder Sajan, CTV. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, Minister Dix, I want to ask you, because uh, I know you defended the Premier's comments uh, earlier this week when you made them to people in their 20s and 30s. Um, there appears to be another group of people who continue to travel despite the recommendation not to. Uh, CTV found some at the ferry terminal today who knew the rules, who heard the message, and traveled anyway. I'm just wondering why you think maybe the message isn't getting through, and what would you say to them? Okay. I'm going to say something first too, which I've said all along, that we know that the people who have had uh, the biggest challenges to overcome over this past year and over a year now, and who have had in many ways the least influence on on events have been uh, young people and whether it's people who are graduating from high school and I know there are youth in my life who've been through this and not having those important celebrations of, of, of passage um, whether it's young people whose job prospects have been um, damaged because this virus uh, transmits in the, and has affected the food and beverage sector and the hospitality and the tourism sector. So I have a lot of empathy for young people and I know it's a very challenging year and we as a community and society have an obligation to make it up to young people. I think I'd say to them um, what we've said consistently throughout, which is that uh, uh, it's not too late to join the fight, that uh, this is going to be a very difficult month. We really need people to follow public health guidance and public health orders. With respect to young people, uh, this is the, re the reality. The reality is there is in increasing transmission amongst young people that's variants of concern in particular. The median age of uh, people with the P1 variant, the variant associated with Brazil or uh, discovered in Brazil, the median age is 28, which means that half of the people essentially are, uh, who get the Brazilian variant are under 28. And, and I think that I think we have to put that in context. Those numbers, that risk, the risk to parents and grandparents and loved ones, and the risk to, your, to ourselves here. If we look around the world in jurisdictions where the variants have grown and where we're in the same circumstances as we are, which is most of the other provinces in Canada of our size and many countries, for example, in Europe, uh, you're seeing increasing number of cases uh, right now linked to the variants. Increasing number in those jurisdictions of young people in hospital, increasing young numbers of young people in critical care, increasing number of young people passing away. So for yourselves, for the ones you love, for the ones you don't know. It's critical for that group 
and everybody else to follow public health guidance right now, especially now. This is about all of us. We are in the midst of a vaccination campaign which has been rolled out, I think, extremely well in BC. But it's, again, one in six of us vaccinated, and even they have to continue to follow public health guidance. But for the rest of us, it's time, I think, uh, for us to really dig in, to s because it would be a terrible thing for all of us, no matter what your age, 25, 35, 45, 65, 85, to at this final moment in the COVID-19 pa pandemic of this phase, any of it, of this immunization phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, to get sick. And we've got to do everything we can to avoid that. No one's to blame for getting sick. Presidents have got sick. Prime ministers have got sick. Uh, all kinds of different people have got sick, although those who are most vulnerable for uh, either by social determinant of health or most vulnerable for other reasons, for health reasons, are most at risk. But all of, these, all of people, people with deep information and lots of support and medical advice and all the best doctors have got sick. We, we don't blame people for getting sick, but we do have to come together now. Us, and the vaccines against COVID-19. That's what I would say to people. It's time for us to come together and listen to public health guidance and follow those orders, especially for this period that we're in now, this period between now, really in the end of June, as we're providing everyone their first dose of vaccine. Pinder, do you have a follow-up? wanted to ask um, about the variants. Uh, there's a relatively low number, I guess, a lower number in the last couple of days. And just wondering, what is the takeaway? Is that good news? Is it a blip? Uh, and also, with the positivity rate in BC growing and being quite high in some parts, is it time to expand testing? Uh, I'm not sure where we would expand testing, and we do have quite a lot of testing being done. We have asymptomatic testing being done where it's appropriate. Um, you know, part of the reason that we're seeing higher percent positives in places like the north, for example, is because we are testing um, the people who are most at risk, and so that's um, appropriate. Uh, the fact that we've seen a lower, incre uh, lower number of variants in the last couple of days, um, even though our surveillance has ramped up, uh, I, I, it's too soon to tell. We've certainly seen small numbers in different um, parts of, of the province, and we're focusing on those, trying not to let them take off. But I think there is an inevitability. Uh, there's a, there's um, a, of a replacement, at least, of variants uh, particularly the B117, and uh, it is uh, replacing the virus that we used to see because it has a um, an ecological or a, a, I'm trying to think of the name of it and what I'm trying to say, but it's on the end of my tip of my brain. But it's uh, because it's got a, a survival edge, so we see this all the time um, where it's able to survival of the fittest, it's able to uh, take over. So we are, of course, paying attention to it and monitoring very carefully. Um, but uh, we'll see. Uh, most important is to reduce transmission. And we reduce transmission, we reduce all of the virus that's circulating in our community. We have time for one more question. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases hospitalizations and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. Our last question today is from Tanya Fletcher at CBC. I was Please just going to say it's competitive advantage. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> so the virus seven has a competitive advantage and has been moving out the other viruses that we've been seeing. So sorry about that. Go ahead. Oh, hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about variants as well. And I know that you've said in the past that more young people are being hospitalized. We know that. And you also mentioned today that more young people are getting, uh, are having cases with the variants. But Alberta's provincial health officer just see, said they're seeing more young people hospitalized due to variants. So is there updated data around the correlation between variants and young people needing critical care in BC? Are there any new commonalities emerging here about which demographics they're hitting and why and which settings are spreading in? I mean, you mentioned community spread, but do you have specifics? Yeah, so I did present that data on Monday um, about the, the so what we're, we're not seeing an increase 
proportion of younger people who are hospitalized. So it's it's about the same as what we're seeing for all of the other, uh, for ever, any virus, about 5%, if anything, it's a little less um, of people who have a variant case who are hospitalized. But because we are seeing an increase um, cases in younger people, the numbers of younger people in hospital are, have gone up. And that means uh, th that the numbers, um, younger people are, are thankfully more likely to survive. So we know the length of stay is longer um, and they more often are, are needing um, ICU care. So the percentage of younger people who are in ICU has gone up. It was about 19% of all ages. Uh, so still 5% of people are hospitalized, 19% of all ages uh, need uh, ICU care. Um, people with variants, that's up to about a third. So we are seeing, but the numbers are still relatively small. We're in the, I think that we're up to about 60 people now. Um, so it, it does make a difference. Um, and we're looking at that in some detail, but uh, uh, where we're seeing transmission again is the same settings that we're seeing it and why we, why we took some of the measures that we did this week. What we see is transmission um, transmission in social networks, so where people are having uh, social gatherings together and uh, many of the same people are working in the restaurant hospitality industry, uh, living in group accommodations, living in crowded uh, homes with others. And we're seeing spread in all of those environments. And particularly, we know that these uh, variants and the virus that we're seeing is spreading more quickly indoors. So our margin of error for having uh, people together, not wearing masks, indoors, with poor ventilation, talking, laughing. Um, you've seen some of that on uh, some of the video from certain places this week. Those are situations that are very risky right now. So those are, that's why we have been focusing on where we can do things safely, and that is outside keeping our distance outside, having those social interactions in ways that are safe right now, particularly if you're going to be around um, your elders and seniors and um, make sure that we can do that safely so that we can all get through this and be protected. Tanya, do you have a follow-up? Yes, and if we could get uh, an answer in French from Minister Dix as well, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, we've seen some staggering case numbers in the days uh, since the circuit breaker was announced on Monday. Can you tell us what British Columbians should be expecting in the coming weeks, as in how will we know if the circuit breaker is working and when? Give us the measuring sticks we should hope for. One thing that is still the same is that uh, uh, the incubation period is about 14 days and the most uh, transmission that we see after exposure is about day five to day seven. So we are now in the place where uh, there is a large number of people who have been exposed. We talked about uh, it's about over 11,000 people right now who are close contacts. And this is what I'm hearing from my colleagues who are doing contact tracing and case management, that the numbers of contacts that individuals are having in risky contacts, so contacts where it can be transmitted, has been going up. And that is one of the reasons why we took the actions that we did. We were, as you know, sort of keeping our own with the, the, the actual infectious contacts staying fairly low. And that has increased in the past 10 days. Um, and that's what we've seen, uh, the spike. So we are not out of the woods by any means. There are 11,000 people who have been exposed. Um, a proportion of those people each day for the next two weeks are going to develop illness. But the things we do today will prevent that next generation of cases. So we are likely to be in for a rough ride for the next few days. And those people who have had contact with somebody who's been ill, you need to stay away from others. You need to stay safe. And just to say, Tenny, I think the presentation was last Thursday uh, on the on the variants information. So it's on the BCCDC website and associated with the presentation on the day. But we can also well, we can also provide it for people again. Je dirais en français que on a pris cette action lundi. La transmission et nos rapports, nos présentations d'aujourd'hui sont fondées sur les transmissions de la semaine prochaine. 
la semaine avant, bien entendu. Donc, euh, ça va prendre des jours pour que ces mesures euh, aient un effet euh, sur, euh, sur euh, nos, les présentations qu'on fait, le nombre de, de tests positifs de COVID-19 qu'on voit euh, dans ces présentations, comme euh, celle d'aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, ça va prendre quelques semaines. C'est la raison pour laquelle euh, le docteur Henry a choisi trois semaines jusqu'au euh, 19 avril pour cette euh, période euh, de changement, de mesure pour réduire la transmission de COVID-19. Donc, ce n'est pas aujourd'hui. Aujourd'hui, c'est une réflexion de la semaine dernière et avant, mais euh, ça va être euh, à la fin de la semaine prochaine ou euh, la semaine euh, après qu'on va, j'espère, euh, voir euh, les, eff les effets de ce qu'on fait aujourd'hui et ce qu'on fait cette semaine. Ce qui est essentiel, c'est que tout le monde suive la, les conseils de la santé publique actuellement. C'est une période difficile, une période d'espoir à cause des vaccins, mais aussi une période difficile à cause de la transmission accélérée de COVID-19 actuellement. Donc, il faut que tout le monde maintenant suive les règles et les conseils de la santé publique. C'est essentiel. Happy Easter. I wish everyone a very, very good uh, long weekend, and you'll be receiving a report, members of the media and of the public, about cases on Saturday. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining.